Well, hey, how's it going, everybody? I'm Sam. Uh, I've been a pastor for 22 years. I'm a student. Um, I get my master's degree in biblical studies, uh, finally. <laughs> um, and you can read uh, some of my writings on my blog, samburke.org. Um, and my training involves biblical studies, theology, and biblical languages. Well, it's time for another Theology Thursday. Um, we are going to uh, jump back into what we started last week, um, when we started this the Theology 101 kind of class, um, what we're doing is uh, more systematic in theology for these. Um, and so last week we started talking about Theology Proper. Theology 101 is a class that goes through Theology Proper, Bibliology, and Christology. And so um, I'm going to walk through. I have a whole a bunch of slides that we're going to walk through. Um, last week we started talking about... Um, the existence of God. And so we walked through um, what the Bible can and cannot do as it relates to the existence of God. And then some apologetic, um, theistic apologetic arguments that we can use um, because the Bible, you know, if you haven't watched it, go back and watch it. But the Bible does not prove the existence of God. The Bible assumes the existence of God. And so in order to try to argue for the existence of God, we can't use the Bible. We have to use other means. And that's why these theistic apologetic arguments exist to try to help us reason uh, why we would believe in God. Today we're going to take a step further, Theology 101, um, and we're going to continue talking about Theology Proper, which is the study of God, okay? Um, it is the study of um, God the Father, um, that's what Theology Proper is, and uh, we're going to jump right in, so follow along the slides, and like I said last week, um, one, we are done with Theology 101, all the way through Bibliology, study of the Bible, Christology, study of Christ, all the way through that, then I will make all of these notes available on my website if you would like them. Um, yeah, so uh, let's jump into it. Today we're going to talk about the attributes of God, okay? Um, so as, by way of introduction to the um, attributes of God, the character of God is best discovered through the lens of Scripture. It's, it's the Scriptures where we, we find... Um, the attributes of God and the character of God described for us. And like I said last time, um, that w as we're taking a look at um, understanding who God is through the pages of Scripture, we get this progressive idea of a blurry picture. Um, the further away from Christ we get, the blurrier the picture of who God is. And the more it's man's attempts to try to figure out. We're going to see some of that today. Um, but the closer we get to Christ, the more... Um, crystal clear God becomes to us and Christ defines who God is and helps us understand who God really is. And so some of the, the Hebrew Bible pictures of God are very, can be very fuzzy. Um, but the closer you get to Christ, the more clear it becomes. Okay. And so, um, where we learn that through and who we see that through is through the, the pages of scripture. And we can kind of see that unfold. Um, another thing that we need to know is that a list of the attributes of God cannot fully define God. It does not exhaust the category of God. Okay. They can only describe the authors of the text experience with God. Um, and so it, there are certain attributes that we're going to see that are um, multiple places throughout Scripture and some that are just in one a handful of places. But we cannot say that these like define, exhaust the, the definition of who God is, that they, they only just tell us what these different authors' experience with God was or um, the stories that were handed down to them that they eventually wrote down or edited um, what those experiences with God were like, okay? Uh, another thing that we need to know is that one attribute of God should not be exalted over another attribute of God unless the text absolutely states that this is the case over and over and over again, okay? Um, so those are some kind of ways to handle the attributes of God. Uh, letter B, God is um, self-existent. This is the very first um, category we're going to get into, very first attribute of God we're going to get into. Um, God is self-existent, um, and this is what this means. Um, God alone owns the property of existence in himself, meaning nothing outside of God created God. God is just, um, he exists, and he exists because he exists. That's what that means. And so God's existence is not dependent upon anyone outside of himself. Therefore, because of all of that, what we can determine is that God then, because he just exists because he is, um, is the source of all life and all things that exist. Um, because God is self-existent, therefore everything else that exists exists because of 
God. Um, so we see that in uh, this whole idea of God is self-existent in a couple of different passages of Scripture. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Actually, um, Paul is talking in Colossians 1 about Jesus, but using that um, his divinity in a way to talk about the self-existence of God. He says, For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Okay? And then uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, God is speaking to Moses, tells him his divine name. He says, God says to Moses, I am who I am. Uh, in the Septuagint, in the Greek, it says, uh, ego emi haon, and it means I am the being. I'm just the one who exists. Uh, and then he says, he said further, thus you, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am, or the being has sent me to you. The one who is self-existent has sent me. Um, just uh, by way of reference, all of these scripture references that I'm going to um, read for us today are all in the NRSV UE, okay? Um, and then the final one is Isaiah 46, 9. Um, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Um, he's just kind of, it's a little bit of playing off and riffing off of this idea that God is self-existent. There's none like him. There's nothing else in all of creation that's like him. Um so God is self-existent. That is the first attribute of God we want to look at. The second one, letter C, is that God is spirit. God is spirit. Not only is God self-existent, God is spirit. This means that God is incorporeal, uh, meaning he doesn't have a fleshly body. Um, he's invisible. He's without substance and therefore free of temporal limitations uh, because he is spirit. John chapter 4, verse 24, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and he says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.17 tells us to the king of the ages, is Paul, or assumed to be Paul talking, or someone writing in the name of Paul, <laughs> uh, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So God is spirit. God is immortal. He's invisible. Uh, and Romans chapter one verse twenty says, ever, "Ever since the creation of the, since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been seen and understood through the things God has made. So they're without excuse. And so, uh, even though God is spirit, what we can understand through the pages of Scripture as He has revealed Himself to humanity over time is that God is is spirit, but He is personal." Um, and when we talk about personal, we mean intellect, purpose, freedom of choice, emotional, all of those things that we see throughout the pages of scripture. Um, God is spirit, but he is personal. Uh, third point under there, the invisible essence of God has never been observed by humanity. No matter what the um, Hebrew Bible actually talks about, and we're going to talk about this in a second. Um, the New Testament clears up some things about the fact that um, God is in, is spirit, and because he's spirit, there, he has an invisible quality to him. They've never really been seen. There's no face of God, like that kind of stuff. So um, we learn that through the New Testament. First Timothy uh, chapter 6, verse 16 says, it, it says this, It is he alone who has Im immortality and dwells in an unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. And like I said, this could be Paul. This could be someone writing in the name of Paul later on. Um, John chapter 1, verse 18 says this. John writes, no one has ever seen God. It is the only son himself, God, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. Um, so Jesus is the one who makes God known to us. That's what um, John is trying to communicate there. No one has ever really seen God. Um, and then Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27, by faith, he left Egypt, unafraid of the king's anger, talking about Moses, for he persevered as though he saw him who is invisible, as though he saw him. Um, it says in, in the Hebrew Bible, you go back through it and it says, you know, um, Moses saw God face to face as like a friend sees someone face to face. Um, and there are many different times where that is attributed in there. So then the question pops up, of course, okay, what about those anthropomorphisms in the Old Testament? Um, an anthropomorphism is a human-like quality given to something that's not human. Um, and so the Bible, especially the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, contains several figures of speech that give God human attributes called anthropomorphisms. Uh, some of these, um, I'll just read these quickly. Exodus chapter 7 verse 5, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out from among them. 
Um, God is spirit, so he doesn't have a hand, but he stretches out his hand here. Uh, Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 and 25. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Um, another anthropomorphism, uh, Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all their hosts by the breath of his mouth. Uh, another anthropomorphism, um, uh, Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. Eyes and ears of the Lord, um, anthropomorphisms. Uh, and then Psalm 89, 10 says, you crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. <laughs> Um, and that, so there's a lot of these anthropomorphisms and, um, what we can gather from that is that these are human beings, um, writing about their experiences with God in a way that connects with them in a human way, um, and, and what they tried to experience. And a lot of these things were, um, uh, especially like the Torah references are probably passed down orally through the generations, um, and so there are stories that are told and passed down, passed down, passed down. And then finally someone writes them. And the people who, who may have finally written them probably did not write them, did not experience them, but, you know, these stories were passed down. Um, there are probably some parts of Deuteronomy that were probably written down and handed down, but a lot of it was, was oral communication. Okay, so um, these are people who are writing about someone else's experience with God, and they're trying to um, basically help um, human beings understand it from a human perspective. And that's what an anthropomorphism is. Okay. And a lot of these are in the Psalms, which are very non-literal, um, poetic kind of expressions. Uh, we see this happen today. Like, um, if someone gets into like a really bad car wreck and they walk away unscathed, they're like, wow, God's eyes were really on me today. Well, it's, it's an, uh, an expression to help us understand in a human way, um, what they're trying to e express. Okay. Um, so God is spirit. Um, letter D, God is immutable. God is immutable. It's another attribute of God. God. Immutability is the doctrine that states God's character is not subject to change. Okay, And that's an important understanding. God's character is not subject to change. That's what immutability is. God is both unchanging and unchangeable. Um, another thing that we can understand from this doctrine is that God never changes in his essence or in his character. Okay, Malachi 3.6, um, Malachi quoting God um, as a, one of his prophets says this, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, have not perished. Um, uh, Psalm 33, verse 11 says this, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Uh, James 1.17 says this, says every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Okay, And then Proverbs 19.21 says, the human mind may devise many plans, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will be established. Meaning, we can change our plans, we can change our mind, we can do all kinds of things, but God's purpose is eternal. Um, is what uh, that is trying to that proverb is trying to um, tell us, um, and so here's here's the deal with this. God may deal differently with pe different people at different times, but He does not alter His purposes uh, or change His nature. Okay, He does not alter His purposes or change His nature. So then the question automatically comes up when you talk about the immu immutability of God. The question comes up, well, what about in those um, Hebrew Bible Old Testament passages on um, God relenting or repenting? Um, so here's the deal. Um, immutability, this idea that God does not change, remember, is the doctrine that states that God's character is not subject to change. In the book of Exodus, when um, it's said that Moses is meeting with God, God passes in front of him and he says that I am uh, I am Yahweh, Yahweh, the, the compassionate and gracious God, um, slow to anger, abounding in love, faithfulness, and mercy, right? Um, forgiving um, is one of the character traits of God. And so God states right from the beginning, this is who I am. This is my character. His character is compassion. His character is mercy. Uh, there are a few different times where um, in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, it says that God relents or he repents of calamity that he's about to bring on to people. One of those is Jonah. Um, and famously, Jonah um, is upset at God 
and runs away from him because God says, go and preach to Nineveh. Um, Nineveh repents. Jonah gets mad about it. And the reason he gets mad is and he quotes to God. He says, I knew that you would relent. I knew you would change your mind about all of this because of your character, because of who you are. You are a compassionate, gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness and mercy and all that kind of stuff. Um, you're forgiving to the core. You That's your character trait. Um, and so... When we see these ideas of God relenting or repenting in the Hebrew Bible, what we are seeing is actually God playing into his character. So it doesn't challenge his immutability, um, that he doesn't change. It's that he changes according to his character, and that is immutability, okay? Um, God's character is not subject to change. Uh, all right, next one, uh, letter E. Another attribute of God is that God is holy, okay? Uh, God is holy. The Number one, the Hebrew term kadesh and the Greek term hagias um, uh, mean to set apart or to make holy. Okay, um, so in the in the Hebrew Bible, kadesh means to to be set apart, and Greek hagias means to be uh, to make holy and to be set apart. Um, God is set apart from his creation. That's what we see through the scriptures. God is set apart from all that is morally unclean. And God is not only set apart from all that is evil, but he is set apart to all that is good. Um, and so when we talk about the holiness of God, we're not just talking about God being set apart from that those things that are evil. We're talking about God being set apart to all the things that are good. Okay, so God is holy, therefore he is good. Therefore, he is set apart from all that is evil and set apart to what is good, okay? And set apart from his creation, anything that's morally unclean. That's what we talk about when we talk about God is holy. Uh, the next uh, part of this, number two, God possesses absolute perfection. We see that through the scriptures. Um, and God's standard is perfection. Uh, number three, holiness is an indivisible part of God's character and is not altered in any way by his dealings with humanity. So, um even though God kind of gets down in the, the mud with us, he does not get dirty. <laughs> That's kind of uh, an easy way to put that, okay? Uh, God cannot violate his holiness, and God's standard of holiness is what defines his justice. And so that's what's important for us to understand. And number four, God's holiness guarantees the unchanging character of his covenants. When God makes a covenant, his holiness is what guarantees that those things won't change. Um, so God is holy. Uh, letter F, God is just. This is another attribute of God. God is just. Um, that means this, God is fair, equitable, and righteous in all of his dealings. Um, and so if holiness concerns the character of God, then justice deals with the expression of that character in his dealings with humanity. Okay. Um, well, holiness concerns the character of God, who he is set apart from all of these things. Then God's justice comes in and deals with the expression of that character of holiness in his dealings with humanity. Um, another thing we need, we can see from this is that God is not a respecter of persons, that all people are treated equally by God um, as he determines, right? And so Psalm 116 verse 5, um, it says, Gracious is the Lord and righteous, our God is merciful. Um, and I think right there that uh, righteous, meaning he is uh, fair, equitable, righteous in all of his dealings with mankind. He's merciful, he says. Um, Psalm 145, verse 17 says this, The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all of his doings. Uh, Romans 2.11 says this, it says, For God shows no partiality, meaning that God doesn't pick and choose. He's, he's equally um, fair, equitable, and righteous in all of his dealings with mankind. God is just. Um, and so what we see through scripture is that God's justice works with his compassion and his forgiveness, not against it. Um, and so we, we need to, to see that um, his, his justice in light of working with his compassion and forgiveness, not juxtaposed to it. Okay, um, so God is just. Letter G, God is love. I think this is one of the most famous attributes of God and one that gets quoted all the time. Um, but and, and I think rightly so. And I think this might be a key 
characteristic. We said that, you know, we can't elevate one above the other one except for maybe this one, <laughs> because this one is um, spoken of over and over and over again in the scriptures, especially New Testament, about who God is, okay? Liturgy, God is love. Definition, God desires what is best for humanity. His, his love is shown in his desire for what is best for humanity. Um, and so what is the nature of God's love? Well, the nature of God's love first is that it is unselfish. It's unselfish. First John uh, chapter 3, verse 16 says this, We know love by this, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. And we, ought to, we ought to also lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. Um, so it's unselfish. He laid down his life. Uh, Romans 5, 8, But God proves his love for us in this, is in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Um, and then 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. It's a, this unselfish, uh, motivated by um, wanting what's best for humanity kind of love. Okay. Uh, second, God's love, the nature of God's love is it is volitional, meaning it it's a choice of the will on our part. He's not forcing us with his love. It's it's a, um, a an offered love, and there's a choice of our will on our part to love him back. Okay, so Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 39. Uh, Jesus said to those people, he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And seconds like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's a choice of the will to love God. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, very similar. This is the Shema in the um, in Deuteronomy. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you are at home, when you are away, when you lie down, and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Okay? Um, it's So God's love is volitional. It's a, a choice of our will to um he offers love and he says i want you to choose to love me um it is everlasting that's the nature of god's love jeremiah 31 3 the lord appeared to him from far away i've loved you with an everlasting love therefore i've continued my faithfulness to you um it's everlasting god's love endures forever it's an everlasting love um the next part of god's love is this it's not only the nature of god's love but who are the objects of god's love uh, well, first and foremost, the objects of God's love are the Son, uh, Jesus. Uh, John 3.35 says this, The Father loves the Son and has placed all things in his hands. Um, John 17.24 uh, says this, uh, oh, I, didn't, I didn't put that one down. Uh, you can go and see John 17.24 for yourself. Um, uh, and then we can go to the next point. Okay, so God, the object of God's love is the Son. Uh, let's look that up real quick. I, I want to make sure we see that. John 17, 24. This is what it says. This is, um, Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Okay, that's John 17, 24. All right, uh, second object of God's love is those who love the Son, God loves. Uh, John 16, 27 says this, it says, For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. And then 1 John 3, 1 says this, See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. See, the Father, the love the Father has given us is because we love the Son. Okay, that's... Uh, for Sean 3 1. Um, the object of God's love in the Hebrew Bible, especially, is Israel. Jeremiah 31 4 says this again, I will build you and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall adorn yourself with, with your tambourines and go forth to dance with the merrymakers. Um, he's, uh, Jeremiah 31 is a really an express, expression of God's love to Israel um, uh, and love for Israel. And then finally, John 3 16. The object of God's love is the world. Uh, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish but have eternal life. Um, and His love for the world is not for the physical ball He created, but for the people um, of this world. Okay. 
So God is love. The nature of God's love, the object of God's love. Um, letter H, God is truth. God is truth. God is consistent with himself and everything he does is true. Um, that's a, what the, the scriptures seem to teach. Um, and so the question is, um, uh, or the, the next response then is, if then, if God is then true, he must keep his promises. Okay. He must keep his promises. Um, and, and so one thing that pops up is like, okay, well, if he keeps his promises, doesn't change his mind. Uh, I think the, the book of Numbers talks about this. Like um, he says, Balaam is uh, quoting to Balak uh, a, a prophetic word from God. He says, I'm not a, I'm not a man that I would change my mind. Uh, right. And then, but we see these other passages of him relenting. And what I think what we're seeing there is that what God is telling Balaam to tell Balak is that I don't change my character. I don't change my mind. When I've come to do something, I keep my promises and I am true to my promises. I true, I'm true to make things happen the way I want them to happen. Um, because he's asking him to change his mind, do what I want you to do. And he's like, oh, that's not how this works. Um, but what we need to understand about God's keeping his promises and he's true and all that kind of stuff is this. He's also immutable and he does not change it in his character. And so if his character is forgiveness and compassion and mercy based on the repentance of the person who um, his justice is coming up against. What we need to understand is this third point here under God being truth is that God's compassion and forgiveness and quote unquote relenting are not inconsistent with him being true because he's being true to himself. He's being true to his character of forgiveness and mercy. Okay. Um, and so these things are not, do not make God untrue. They just make him consistent with who he is character wise. Uh, Next attribute of God is um, God is omnipresent. This letter I, God, God is omnipresent, which means this. God is everywhere present at the same time in the universe, and yet he's a personal being. Okay, it's very important for us to understand. Everywhere present at the same time, yet he's personal. He's everywhere present with his whole being. He's not divided. He's not diffused. Okay, he's not like split up into different parts of God everywhere. Like he's everywhere present with his whole being. Uh, and there's three words that we use about this. First is immensity. Immensity is a theological term meaning that God is not restricted by space or geography, even if humanity thinks he is. <laughs> um, and so there's there's a lot of um, uh, talk and ideas about the fact that, you know, maybe ancient Israel thought that they could not worship God in foreign lands because God was restricted to this one space and one land. Um, but in, when we actually see who God really is, like I said, fuzzy pictures in the Hebrew Bible and in the Old Testament. But as we get closer to Christ, um, the pictures become more and more clear and we understand the immensity of, of God's being. Okay. And he's not restri restricted by space or time or geography or any of that kind of stuff. Um, even if humanity might think he is, um, he's not. Um, the second theological word is imminence. Imminence is a theological term that means God is in the world acting within and through his creation. Um, God is not distant from his creation. It's uh, not, it's not deism. This is, you know, theism. He's, he is in the world acting within and through his creation. Um, he has an active role. And then transcendence um, is the third word when we talk about omnipresent, meaning it's a theological term referring to the holy otherness of God, that he is actually transcendent. He's above and beyond his creation. He is not um, a part of his creation. Uh, Psalm 139, verses 7 through 13 is a good place we can see that. First Kings 8, 27 through 30. Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24. You can look all those up. These are great passages of scripture that talk about the omnipresence of God, that he... he um, you know, Psalm 139, you, you saw me in my mother's womb, you formed me, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, uh, God is omnipresent. Uh, letter J, God is omniscient. God is omniscient. God's knowledge is all-inclusive. He knows all things past, present, and future, whether actual or possible. <laughs> um, so he, he knows what is actual, and he also knows what it could be possible. I think that's a part of his omniscience. Um Underneath that, the point there, God has no need to learn or be taught. There is no progress, progression of knowledge with God, even though there is a progression of knowledge about God with people. There is no progression of knowledge with God. God is not somehow having to learn new things, okay? And so Romans chapter 11, 
verses 33 through 36 is where we see um, this whole idea. Uh, Paul writes this, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom of, and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways, for who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor, taught him anything? Um, who has given a gift to him to receive a gift in return? Like, who can give God anything? Who can teach God anything? Who is who can understand all of his judgments, all of his wisdom, all of his knowledge are so far beyond um who we are. That's what Paul is trying to write here in this, in the doxology there. Um, meaning God's knowledge is perfect. God has perfect knowledge. Okay. It's all inclusive knowledge, past, present, future, actual, or possible. Uh, God knows all the free actions of man and what went into making those choices. This does not rem remove humans free will to choose just that God is omniscient, even in his foreknowledge of things that are actual or possible. Okay. There's all kinds of scripture references that we can look at there. Psalm 147, Matthew 10, 29 and 30, Job 26, 6, Psalm 33, Isaiah 46, 9 through 11, Matthew 11. Um, and like we said, we're doing systematic theology. So we are um, we are using a, a framework that is multivocal, okay? Or not multivocal, univocal, trying to pull together different passages of scripture all over the, the Bible um, and unapologetically doing so. Okay, that's what systematic theology is anyway. Uh, so God is omniscient. Um, God is omnipotent, letter K. Uh, God is able to do all things that are consistent within his nature, character, and purpose. He's all powerful and is able to do all things that are consistent within his nature, character, and purpose. Um, there are things that, some things that God cannot do, though. And there are four, uh, four things that I want to put down here. Uh, number one, he cannot deny himself. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 tells us that. Um, it says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, but he cannot deny himself. Um, uh, God cannot lie. Titus ch chapter 1, verse 2, it says, in the hope of eternal life, that God who never lies promised before the ages began. God can't, he is truth, and so he cannot lie. Um, uh, so where it looks like you might want to go, well, I think God might lie to you. God did not lie. There's something else going on there. Because God does not lie. Uh, God cannot sin. Okay, Sin is the, the word hamartia. We'll get there in theology 2 or 301, way down the road, um, when we get to this the theology of hamartiology, which is the, the theology of sin. Um, but it's that word um, hamartao, which means, or hamartano, which means um, to sin or I sin. Um, James 1.13 is the scripture passage there, which says, No one when tempted should say, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. God cannot commit evil. He does not sin. Uh, and then anything else in opposition to God's character or nature are things that God cannot do. God cannot go against his character. God cannot go against his nature. Everything else God is able to do, as long as it's consistent with his nature, character, and purpose. Okay? Uh, and then finally... Um, under God is omnipotent. God's omnipotence is manifested in five different areas. In creation, in nature, in history, in heaven, and redemption. Um, and you can look up all those verses right there. Jeremiah 10, 12 for creation. Uh, Jeremiah 10, 13 for nature. Um, he he kind of goes one to the other. Um, over all of history, Daniel 4, 17. Romans 13, 1 through 7. Um, over heaven, Daniel chapter 4, verses 34 and 35, and then redemption, um, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 24. Uh, so in summary about the attributes of God, this has been a 30-something minute video, so I knew this was going to be a long one. Uh, we discover, discover the attributes of God best through the lens of the pages of Scripture as the individual authors and characters experienced God, Okay. Um, and then the second point of summary for this is this list is not an exhaustive concordance on the character and nature of God, but gives us a beautiful framework to see and understand God through. Well, I, hopefully this was um, beneficial for you as you uh, start thinking about theology and we start talking about the attributes of God, who God is, and how we see that through Scripture. Um, uh, the next video that we'll talk about on Theology Thursday is we're going to talk about um, the names of God that we see all throughout the Hebrew Bible and through the New Testament. Um, excited to do that. Uh, um, hopefully, like I said, this was beneficial for you. Like, subscribe, comment, and I'll see you in the next one.